My name is Ricky Spindler, and I am one of the pastors here. It's just a privilege to have you with us uh, today. We're grateful for that. How about that worship today? Can we just give it up for our team? It's wonderful. Also, like to welcome those who are watching online. It's just a privilege. Thank you for joining us. Wherever you're watching at around the world, we often have around 70 or so nations that watch us and tune in on a regular basis. So thank you, thank you, thank you. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to 1 Thessalonians? It is a book maybe you've never even heard of. And 1 Thessalonians, if you open your Bible, start going to the right, almost to the end. If you hit this book called Revelation, you went too far, come back. You got Hebrews, you got First and Second Timothy. If you see some dudes, Titus and Philemon, you need to keep coming back. If you see First and Second Corinthians, go to the right again, and then you'll be right in there. Look for a guy named Timothy and hang a left, okay? Just real, hopefully I made that as clear as possible for you. And it's just a privilege to have you with us today. And we are going to kind of begin, as we begin to march towards Easter, I want to begin just a, a series and we may be here for several months just looking at this one book of the Bible called First Thessalonians. For those of you who don't know, we just kind of wrapped up a 21-day uh, season of prayer and fasting. And during this season, I just we had other things on the docket that we planned to do, but I just sensed that God was saying he wanted us to spend some significant time in this book called First Thessalonians. And it's written by a man by the name of the Apostle Paul. And, I, and I'll, I'll get to why this book's so important and why I think it really speaks to us today. But I'd like to begin, if I could, by just setting up a story, a story to kind of set up why we're going to be doing this series. And in 1945, there was a group of Hungarian soldiers, this is a true story, that were captured by the former USSR, now what we call Russia. And they were imprisoned, and they would be imprisoned for 55 years. And because of some political pressure and political maneuvering, they were released in the year 2000. So a lot of these young men went in in their 20s and came out in their 70s. And many of them had suffer, uh, suffered great psychiatric damage. And one of them seemed uh, for more far gone than the others because of all the time they spent in solitary confinement and he requested, this soldier requested that he be evaluated by a psychiatrist from his own country, from Hungary. So they flew in a Hungarian psychiatrist and they determined, no, you have not lost your mind. No, you're not insane. It's just that all of the solitary isolation has really messed with your psyche and your emotions. They pleaded with the Russian government to allow them to be released, this individual soldier, and to be taken back to his home country to be treated. They granted that, and on his way out, he's being wheeled out in a wheelchair. He asked for one thing. He asked for a mirror. And he thought, of all the things you could ask for, why do you ask for a mirror? And so here is this 75-year-old uh, soldier. He went in when he was 20. He asked for a mirror. And he holds the mirror. They find one, and, they, and he's sitting in the wheelchair, and, they, and he puts it in front of them. And he just sees himself in this reflection. He begins to weep uncontrollably like a little child, just sobbing. And when he gains his composure, they ask him, why are you weeping? And he said this, I have not seen my face for 55 years. Could you imagine you, the last time you saw your face? You were in your 20s. You were at the prime of your life fighting for a cause that you believed in, only to end up as a prisoner of war, and then to see your face again in the sunset season of your life after being in prison for 55 years you see all the wrinkles of age and now you see yourself as a 75 year old man and he wept you know a mirror is an instrument that we use to really discern our physical appearance and make adjustments some of us should make adjustments when we see ourselves in the mirror right we change our hair we change our outfit we move that thing and on our teeth that our friends should have told us about but now we have a mirror and we can see it a mirror is an instrument that shows you physically as you really are not as you pretend to be but as you really are the question i have though as we begin this look in first thessalonians where is an instrument that can act as a mirror for the soul. I mean, 
well, what can I hold up to my life in the soul dimension and see as I really am and to make adjustments and to bring alignment to my life? I believe the scripture really offers some insight into this. It says in the book of Proverbs, as a man looks into a water and the water reflects the face, someone can look into the word of God and it can reflect to them their true heart. It can reveal to them as they really are. I, I, I like what St. Augustine centuries ago wrote when it comes to the scriptures. He said, when scripture speaks, God speaks. And we take a high view of scripture here at Stone Creek Church. And we believe that when scripture speaks, God speaks. There's a, a verse in 2 Timothy 3.16 says, the scripture is God breathed. There's 66 books in the Bible. It's a library of books, old and new, two divisions there. And there's about roughly 40 or so different authors. But they are not the primary authors. God used them, but the Holy Spirit is the author of Scripture. It's God-breathed, inspiring these people to write what they wrote. And so the Scripture goes on to say that it can be useful for instruction, correction, rebuke. It can also be used to grow in godliness and righteousness. So when we look at 1 Thessalonians over the next few weeks, I believe we're going to be holding up a mirror to our lives, so our soul, and we should make adjustments. It's going to challenge us. It's going to show us as we really are, not just as individuals, but corporately as well. It was written by a guy by the name of the Apostle Paul. That may not mean a whole lot to you, but in Christianity, he is one of the primary authors of Scripture. An apostle is an early leader in the Christian church. It is someone who has a lot of authority. And if you were to put it on a hierarchy, they're at the top. They had the ability to uh, speak and to give correction, but also to say, hey, this is what we feel like you should do in this moment. They would often write these letters uh, to the church. They carry great weight and great authority. Well, apostle Paul is one of the early apostles. And he is an early convert to Christianity. He is not one of the original 12 that walked with Christ, but shortly thereafter, he was its greatest enemy of the church of Christianity who turned into its greatest advocate and defender. He is a prolific writer. He is a prolific leader. He gives a lot of practical, good theology when it comes to the church. A lot of things that we do now is because of his leadership and insights. And so on his missionary journeys, he took a couple of those. On a second one, he ends up in the city uh, kind of through the, the sovereign direction of God in the city of Thessalonica. We'll talk a little bit more about that. You can read about it in Acts chapter 17, the full narrative and stories recorded by a man by the name of Luke in the book of Acts. He's there and he, he spends the first three weeks preaching in the synagogues, is what he did. He was a Jewish man. He would take it to, the, to his people. When they rejected him and they were not received, he would preach it to the Gentiles who were there, the non-Jews, and they would respond. And and so he, a little church is born in a couple of months. Converts, people come to faith. They hear the gospel. They get saved. The church comes. He thinks he's going to be there for a while. There's intense persecution. He has to flee for his life. He hides. They sneak him out at night because they're trying to kill him. He's gone for months, years. He ends up being in prison somewhere else. And he's in the back of his mind. Whatever happened to that little church I planted? It's only there for a period of time. What happened? Are they still there? There was intense persecution. Almost took me out. Did they get murdered? What happened to the church? So he sends, years later, at a time later, he sends Timothy, one of his associates, associate pastors. He says, go check out that church. See what you find and come back, because I can't go. He comes back with a glowing report. The church is flourishing. It's great. And so Paul, just overcome with joy, he decides, you know what? As a pastor, he's going to write a letter celebrating the fact all the good things that they've done, and giving them some instruction and challenges as they move forward. So this is a heart of a pastor. He uses a metaphor as a, of mothers and fathers, and this is a real tenderness of a spiritual leader writing uh, to the church. So Thessalonica was no small city. It was one of the largest cities in that day. And that day, a city of hundreds of thousands, 200,000 was a major city. It was in the Roman Empire. It, you would think of it as a New York, a Boston, or a Houston, a Dallas, a major city in its time. Two reasons why it was so important. Number one, it was on a port. It was right on the edge of a sea. So the military campaigns could be uh, coming out of there. Merchants would sail in out of there. It's a wealthy city. It's a port city. Uh, it was also... One of the things that made the Roman Empire so tough and so hard to conquer and so successful was they were smart and they built roads. 
interwoven with a, a, an intense road system, but the, the most famous road that connected their major cities was the Ignatian Road. Every 50 miles or so, they would plant a major city along this road to expand their empire. Well, Paul followed this road in every major city. He would try to plant churches and hoping they would influence the rural areas. This was a city that had Greek temples, Jewish synagogues, and Romans who paid homage and worshiped Caesar, their emperor. And then Paul shows up in this plurality of religion and confusion. And there sits Thessalonica, and he begins to proclaim, and with success, sees people come to faith in Christ. So it's on that canvas, if you will, that Paul begins to write these words that we're about to read. And I'm only going to give to you the first three verses. We're going to just take, tackle the first three this Sunday, and hopefully as we move forward, we'll tackle more. But let me read to you the first three verses of 1 Thessalonians. And if you haven't found it yet, just ask your neighbor and they'll help you out. Here it is. Verse 1. Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember you before our God and Father. Your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us just, I'm going to leave these three. If you would like my notes, they're on uh, our app, Stone Creek app. You can download that. But we're going to leave this scripture up the entire time. I'm just going to break this down. Everything in this speaks, okay? So let's look at the greeting. Let's look at verse 1. It says that Paul... Silas and Timothy. Now, in this time when you would write a letter, you would introduce who you were, second, who you were writing the letter to, third, give a standard greeting, and then fourthly, you would give some sort of encouragement. So Paul is saying, here's who's writing this, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Now, this is not customary. Paul, from the very get-go, does something that is not normal in his culture. Normally, you only listed the person at top, whoever the leader was, whether that was a centurion, that was an empire, a senator. But this is an apostle, and he could have just left his name only. But instead, he puts Paul, Silas, and Timothy. These were not apostles, but these were early church leaders. Think of lead pastors, associate pastors in that context. This signifies, I think, two things. Number one, it really speaks to the humility of Paul. And the humility of Christian leadership. It's not an us or a me, it is, or not a me, it's a we. And so he speaks to the plurality, his philosophy of ministry. But it also lends credibility to two young leaders that said, listen, these guys can be trusted as well. Uh, one of the things I do whenever I, I want to look at a text is I don't want to just be stuck in a Western mindset. When we view the scriptures, we can't help but bring our culture to it. I don't want to just read, read Western, for European, or American, or United States uh, theology. So I read a lot of theology from Asia, some theology from South America. One of my favorite commentaries is an African Bible commentary from the continent of Africa. About 30 to 35 significant theologians give commentary from all the different 30 to some different nations to the biblical text. And I love what they see at the very beginning when, they, when we say Paul, Silas, and Timothy. In the commentary, they just throw in there a Nigerian proverb. Any Nigerians in the place today? Come on. Any, they see? Woo. You always hear a Nigerian before you see one, okay? <laughs> woo, woo. Come on. That's awesome. Am I right? I'm right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here's what it says. Nigerian proverb. One cannot catch a flea or beat a drum with just one finger. One cannot catch a flea or beat a drum with just one finger. I like that. Paul is saying, even in the greeting, I cannot do this on my own. It's not just me. It's all of us together doing God's work. I would also say this. In the kingdom of God, we do not push ourselves to levels of leadership. We do not push ourselves forward in God's kingdom. God lifts up. God sits down. We allow God to promote and open doors in his timing in his own way. Who's he writing to? He's writing, it says, to the church of the Thessalonians. Notice there's no street address here. He's not writing to a building. This isn't going to be delivered into some building. The, the early Christianity didn't have buildings. That didn't come till centuries later with Constantine when he nationalized religion and gave them buildings. In some ways, it kind of ruined the early Christian church. 
but when they would meet, they would meet in homes. They would meet in open spaces. It would have been foreign for you to call yourself a Christ follower and neglect being a part of the community of faith. See, these were a group of people, the Thessalonians. These are the ones who have the shared experience with the gospel of Jesus Christ and our mission for him. These are the ones that I'm writing to. Make sure you read this letter in their presence. And I think sometimes in a Western mindset, sometimes we can think that we can be a Christ follower and just neglect gathering together and being a part of the community. I'm just going to do my own thing. That is so counter to what the biblical Christianity looks like. We need one another. This building is not the church. We are the church. The shared experience of the gospel of Christ and being on mission and proclaiming that together, that's what makes the church to the church of Thessalonians. We always thank God for all of you. Now, when you study Paul's writings, you have to understand that rarely does he thank God for things or experiences, but he almost always thanks God for people. And I think that's a great insight for us. The greatest gifts sometimes that God gives to you and I are the people that he places in our lives. And we should thank God for them. When's the last time maybe you thank God for your family, for your spouse? I mean, you need to thank God for that spouse. You need to thank God for the people that he's placed in your life. I had the privilege in, often in my position to be with people in their last moments. I had it again this week. I was able to sit with an 80-something-year-old woman who was... Uh, was going to die in a few short hours or days. She knew it. She wanted to have one last conversation with her pastor. Those are always interesting conversations. It's amazing what people want to talk about in their last moments. We read the scriptures. She hadn't lost her sense of humor. I love that. Was joking with me the whole time. It was awesome. In and out of consciousness. But you know what she said more than once? I just really thank God for my family. I just want to thank him for my family. I think, isn't that amazing at the end? You could thank God for a lot of things, but I think she, I would say, had it right. But just in general, we should season our prayer life with moments of thanksgiving. I think if you sense that you're dry and you just aren't getting anywhere in your prayer life, I would just say, stop asking for things and experiences and just begin to practice for gratitude. That's the danger when you look at prayer is just saying, God, petition, petition, petition. Stop doing that for a season and start practicing gratitude and thanksgiving and watch how the spiritual dryness just lifts off of your prayer time. Then Paul moves into this thing where he says, we remember certain things about you. Here's what you're known for. Let me, let me brag on you a little bit. Let me give you some encouragement. Now, what follows is probably the greatest definition of what it means to be a Christian. If you're sitting there and you're wondering how Oh, do you define a Christian? What does one look like? What should they act like? If you're wondering how you would define a church, what is a church supposed to be like and act like? You're getting ready to read it and you're getting ready to hear it. Paul outlines three virtues and their output and their production in our life. Here's what he says. He says, you are known for a faith that produces works. You are known for a love that labors. And you are known for a hope that endures. You have a faith that works you have a love that labors, and you have a hope that endures. Listen, without exception, these three words define every Christ follower. You cannot be a Christ follower and not have these three words define you. First of all, you are a believer. You believe certain things to be true. Without them, you are not a Christ follower. You are a believer. You are a lover. And I invented a new word here. Last one, you're a hoper. Put it in there. <laughs> you are a believer. You are a lover. And you are a hoper. What do these three virtues have in common? Now, this is Paul, though it's not listed in the order of chronology. This is the first letter Paul ever wrote to a church. Now, this is important because he's early on in his theology. You'll see these things played out later on in different books and different uh, portions of Scripture. But here's what all these virtues have in common. They're outward in, in their expression. Think about this. A faith directed towards God, a love directed towards other, and a hope that is towards the future. Okay? A faith directed towards God, a love directed towards others, and a hope that's directed towards the future. Look at them in concepts of time. Okay? A faith that rests on the past, a love that works in the present, 
and a hope that looks towards the future, past, present, and future. But Paul just doesn't just say, hey, these are great virtues. It's, he gets practical. It's what these virtues are doing. He says your faith, it works. It's producing something. He says your labor or your love, it's laboring. It's not just love in general. It's doing something as well. It labors. And your hope, you just don't have a generic hope. It endures. It produces endurance inside of you. So he expounds on, if these things are at work, here's what it looks like when these three virtues are at work in your life. So let's look at these as we have a remainder of time, about 15 minutes here. He says this, your work produced by faith. Now, what I'm not saying is, is that you're saved by works. Paul would later on say, would say, you are saved by grace through faith. The vehicle by which we experience God's grace is faith. What is faith? Faith is a response of the soul to the word of God. When you and I hear the word of God, put our trust in the word of God, and act on the word of God, that is an act of faith. And when you do that, it will produce works. The works comes after the faith, not before the faith. We cannot work ourselves into the kingdom of God. We do that by faith, but then, listen, there are visible works, signs, vital signs, if you will, that take place afterwards that prove to you and to everyone else that this faith was saving faith and it's real faith because the faith that saves produces new works. That faith that you have on the inside of you is working. It's producing something. It is not laying dormant. It is challenging you, changing you. In other words, let me say it like this. When you've experienced real faith, there will be change. There will be difference. You will know it, and everyone around you will know it. Let me illustrate it to you like this. If my wife moved into your home, you would know that she was there. <laughs> because your home would look different. I went around went out and played basketball one time. I came home to a whole new living room. She loves to remodel. She has a vision. She, there's some work that takes place when she moves in. When Christ moves into your life through faith, listen, there's some remodeling. There's some work that goes on and takes place. It's expressed in this one song. Maybe you've heard about it. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I once was lost, but now I'm found. See, what is the work of faith? It's stories like this. I once was this, but now I am this. I once was bound by drug addiction, but now I have been set free. I once was filled with anxiety, but now I am this. Now listen, what I'm not talking about is perfection. I don't believe in that. And they in this part, in this world, in eternity, yes. But not here. It is a spiritual journey that begins to take place. But I do believe in progress. It's progress, not perfection. So Pastor Ricky, what are you saying? I'm saying this, if there's no works, and there's no visible transformation that you can see and other people can see, then you have not had a saving experience with Jesus Christ. You may love the songs. You may love the church. You may love the community. You may love the diversity. You may love what it stands for. You may love the cause of justice and injustices, solving it in the world. But if you have not had a transforming work in your life that changes the way that you live, then you have not been born again. And let that truth settle in. That's great because at the end of the service, you're going to have an opportunity to accept the gospel, to receive saving faith and put your trust in him. Let me just bring it more real to you. What am I talking about? Let's bring it to the 21st century. If you've had an experience with Christ, but it doesn't change the way that you talk, you didn't get saved. If you're still cussing like a sailor, you're still talking trash, galloping, and sandering, and it hasn't changed for a long time, I'm glad that you experienced some tingles in a service, but you did not get saved. If you, listen, if you have come to faith in Christ and you continue to live with your boyfriend and girlfriend and have sex outside of marriage, this is just real talk. Listen, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is the work of faith. And I hear this all the time. I'm not convicted about that. Yeah, we just did this, we do that. And come every week. Listen, I am glad that you love the church. But if it's not working and transforming the way that you do relationships and the way that you do life, you have not been born again. You have not been saved. The faith inside you has not taken root. 
I didn't say that, he said it. So we'll talk about that as we move on. This is going to be, I told you, the mirror, the soul. Your work produces faith. Or your faith produces work, sorry. And then we'll keep moving. It's your labor is prompted by love. And I am purposely moving on and not answering those questions because next week we're going to talk about the power of the gospel, what it is, what it's not, and how it can transform your life. So I want you to sit with that tension. Here's another one. Your labor prompted by love. Two words here. Labor, he uses the Greek word kopos. Strenuous and sweat producing toil. Even to the point of fatigue. Then he uses the word love here. And that is the Greek word agape. It means a sacrificial or the, the God love, if you will. He says, listen, you will labor when you are prompted by God's sacrificial love. Now, when you came to faith in Christ, you did not love Jesus immediately. You didn't. You trusted him. And as you experienced him, you grew to love him. And as you grew to love him, you will love to serve him, but also you will love to serve his people. There will be a labor, a work. You will work to the point of sacrifice, to the point of sweat and toil to see people come into the kingdom and experience the love that you've experienced. You will sacrifice for others to come into the experience. You can't remain idle. There's a movement. You're going to labor for it. You're going to work day and night for it. You're going to stay up and lose sleep for it. Let me give it to you in a modern context. How many of you have, if you've ever had children, about one, two o'clock in the morning, they start crying. They're a newborn. You just brought them home from the hospital. They need to be changed. They need to be fed. They wake you up from a dead sleep. And listen, you do not like it when they wake you up. Am I pre real preaching here? Am I the only one? From a good dream sleep. You got to be up in the morning. You get up. You change the diapers. You feed the kid. Why do you do that? Because love labors. It sacrifices. It works to the point of fatigue. Sacrifices so that others can come to faith in Jesus Christ. I like what Dr. Martin Luther King said about this, is that the agape love is the love of God operating in the human heart. As, it, as God's love begins to be shed in my heart, it prompts me to labor, to work hard for people inside the church and outside of the church to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Your faith that produced works. Your labor that produced love. All right, or your love that produced labor. And then next is this, your endurance inspired by hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Your endurance inspired by hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, hope is always about the future. Two words there, hope and endurance. Hope is always about the future. Like, for instance, I don't hope that I have this watch. I already have this watch. I don't hope to have this shirt. I know some of you hope that you had this shirt. Come on, somebody. <laughs> No, it is not your side, but it's size. If you want it, though, TJ Maxx has it on sale. Okay. <laughs> we only hope for things that we don't already have. So he's saying, hope in the Lord Jesus, but I thought they already had Christ. So what's he talking about? He is talking about the return of Christ. When Christ, ultimately, the scriptures point to the fact, not only has he died, not only has he risen, but he is coming back. And he's saying that is the hope that this church as a collectively, but also uh, as individually, you have a hope that he will one day come back and that hope will produce in you endurance. And that word literally means uh, a togetherness that makes you strong. In this church, in this context, they were experiencing severe persecution. I mean, when you read about the atrocities that this early church went through as they experienced the gospel, it was severe. And Paul's saying, hold up, you had a hope that allowed you to keep it together and to be patient in the midst of a great torture when other people would have lost their ever-loving mind. Where did that hope come from? Well, it's tied to Jesus Christ and something that he's going to do in the future. He's going to come back. Now, why does that give me hope in the present? Because this, when Jesus Christ comes back, he will make every wrong right. He will reward faithfulness. He will repay evil its due. He will heal all sickness. 
Now, maybe in this world, we may not see the deliverance. Maybe you will be a martyr. Maybe you will die of the cancer. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. But ultimately, in the end, Christ is coming back and all things will be brought to order and he will make everything right. And because of that, though you may lose in this world, eventually God will make it all right. So you can have hope. You can keep it together when all around you seems as if it is falling apart. See what Paul does at the end of every one of these chapters, five chapters, he talks about the second coming of Christ. The whole book really is pointing how we should live when Christ comes back. Now in uh, in our terms, when, I, when I'm writing a message, one of the things that they say to do good communication skills is you begin with the end in mind. You say, what do I want them to do? And what do I want the response to be? And then begin to work your way back to the beginning. Begin with the end in mind. That way you ensure alignment all the way through. Paul, first letter to this church that he planted. Christ is coming back. That's the end. Let's work our way back to where your situation is. Here's how you live. Two things he really hits hard on. Number one, you have to live with a sense of urgency. Your faith, put it to work. Your love, make sure you're laboring. You can't sit on the sidelines. We have a work to do. We have people that need Christ, a gospel that needs to be proclaimed. You cannot remain idle. There's an urgency. He's coming back. Secondly, he says um, the main theme, one of the main themes is if he's coming back, He's coming back for a clear and spotless bride. It says that we should live holy and blameless. If you live with the, a constant thought that Christ could come back at any moment, you know what that do? It'll change the way you make decisions in the moment. You will gravitate towards holiness. We'll define these words. I know I'm using churchy words, but we'll define them later. And blamelessness. You'll live a righteous life. You won't make certain decisions because you don't want Christ to return when you're in the middle of it. You ever been caught by your parents doing something you shouldn't do? That's a whole other sermon, though. Okay. But here's what I'd like to do is I'd like us to end with the elements of communion. It is a communion Sunday, and so we're going to distribute the elements of communion. So I'm going to ask the ushers to get ready as we distribute the elements of communion. I'm going to say a couple of things. In no way do I want you to feel condemned, but I do want all of us to feel convicted. And I don't want you to think, man, it's about progress, not perfection. And if you're here and you're, and you're really moving out of a lifestyle of something, that's great. Keep moving. But if you're here and you've grown up pathetic and your faith's no longer working, you're doing a great work, let you be challenged by this message today.